Good morning and welcome back to our webinar series looking at Australian pavement design systems. So this week we'll be discussing the empirical design chart that we use for unbound granular pavements. Here's my contact details once again. And so today's a fairly short presentation, 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have some questions. And remember, just to click on the Q&A button, um, enter your, the slide number that the question relates to and type in the question. That would be great, thank you. So this design chart that we're talking about is in part two of the guide, which is the pavement structural design guide. And so this week we're discussing this empirical method which is based on the performance empirical data about how roads perform. And next week, we'll be talking about the mechanistic empirical design method, where we, where we also include in, into consideration uh, the response to load of pavements that we predict with a model. But this week, we'll be looking at just the empirical chart. So this, this chart's applicable to unbound granular pavements. Uh, with thin bituminous surfacing. So we discussed what the, that type of pavement was in the first week of this series where the granular, unbound granular pavement might consist of a, a, a granular base course and a, a granular sub-base above uh, the natural subgrade, or it could include select fill layers uh, above very weak subgrades, for example. And shown on the, the, the photograph on the right-hand side is the placement of a sprayed seal bituminous surfacing, which is the most common type of surfacing for granular pavement. So in terms of the Australian sealed road network, these, these, this type of pavement might comprise about 90% of the road length. So it's a, a major pavement type used in Australia. So, this is the chart uh, that will, it's called figure 8.4 and it's been called that chart for many years now. And so we dare not change the figure number in part two of the guide because everyone has been referring to figure 8.2 for so many years. So this is what the presentation's about. It, it's commonly used for uh, a spray with a sprayed seal, terminus seal, but it can be used also with asphalt layers uh, up to 40 millimetres thick, as I'll discuss. So at, this chart provides a means of designing the total thickness of granular material over the subgrade and um, with some minimum base thickness requirements. So the distress mode that we're designing for is rutting and, and deformation of the granular pavement materials and the subgrade. So we're designing for surface deformation and that surface deformation could be a result of the granular layers deforming and also the subgrade and select fill layers uh, deforming. So that's the mode that we're designing for with the chart. So there's no considerations of fatigue either from ash thin asphalt surfacings or cement layers, no considerations for off fatigue in this chart. Uh, and it's based on historical observations of in-service performance of pavements. And a chart of this form, I've traced it back to the 1940s when it was first became used in Australia. So a chart of this type has a very long uh, pedigree goes back for many years and in its current form has probably been used for you know, at least 30, maybe 40 years. So the chart, if we look at it a bit more detail, on the horizontal axis is the design traffic loading in ESAs. And we discussed about the design traffic in ESAs last week. So you calculate the number of load repetitions in equivalent standard axles over the design period. The other thing uh, that it, uh, the thickness depends on is the 
sub the CBR or California bearing ratio of the material that is going to be covered by the pavement. So it's shown on the on the on the verdict on this on the right hand side axis, these each of these curves here relates to different Californium bearing ratios, so different strengths of the supporting layers. And as we'll discuss later, this could be uh, a, a granular layer as well as a subgrade layer. And so this is the thickness on the on the other side of the axis on the left hand side here. We have the thickness of cover. Over those subgrade, over those CBR strengths. So this is the thickness of material that's required over uh, a material of these CBR strengths. So the, as I'll discuss, the, the, that thickness could comprise a granule material, it could comprise a select material as well, or it could comprise a lime stabilized layer down lower, for example. So we'll discuss a bit more about that later, but it, it's you'll see that it's not just labelled thickness of granular materials, it's labelled thickness of material. For lightly traffic uh, roads, we have another chart. And uh, so, so we do provide a method that goes down to uh, 10 to the three ESAs in terms of design traffic. So the key to uh, the use of this chart is the California bearing ratio test that we discussed in, in weeks one and two, where a plunger, uh, where you prepare a specimen uh, in, a, in a mold and apply a, a load and measure the, the load that's required for different amounts of penetration of the plunger into the material. So this is the key test for use of this design chart. And th these are some typical uh, CBR strengths and 100% was the reference value for a limestone in California. So all the other values are relative to that Californian limestone. So typically for an Australian crushed rock base, they're generally above 80%. And some in Victoria it might be 120%, so better than the Californian limestone. Um, for granulate, for the upper sub-base layers, you know, it's typical CBRs might be 30 to 60, uh, whereas for lower sub-base layers, it might be 15 to 30. So, and you can see then the different typical subgrade strengths in terms uh, from a silt you know, might be two or one, uh, or to um, a sand might be um, 10 to 15, for example. So those values uh, become important because each of those CBR values influences the amount of cover required over those materials, including the granular materials, as we'll talk about. So the chart gives the total cover uh, for over the subgrade, over the, the select material or over a granular material according to its CBR value. So this is the thickness of material cover over any of those material types. So this is an example here. If we had a situation where the subgrade had a design CBR of five, and we had a design traffic loading of two by 10 to the six ESAs, the total thickness of cover over that, so that, over that subgrade would be 420 millimetres. So that gives the cover requirements over the subgrade to inhibit it deforming uh, and resulting in surface deformation to an unacceptable level. So that controls the amount of deformation in the subgrade by providing that amount of cover. Now, in terms of the material, uh, how that 420 might be made up, you could, for example, use 140 millimeter thickness of a select fill layer with a CBR10. And you can see on the design chart there that for CBR10 material, which this select material is, it requires about 280 
millimeters of cover. So you could use select fill, but it would only be used from over that 140 uh, millimeter thickness range. It, that, that fill itself needs cover of 280 millimeters to inhibit deformation of it. Similarly, you could use a lower granular subbase you know, with a CBR 15, for example. And in that case, you can see you could use that material up to the CBR 15 line. So it could be used over a, a 210 millimetre depth of the 420 total. So you could use the granular subbase layer instead of a select fill, and it could be used for more of the cover requirements over the subgrain. But it, it still needs an amount of cover itself, as you can see. It needs roughly about 220 millimeters of color to inhibit deformation of that granular subbase. So in selecting how you might make up the total cover of 420 millimeters in this case, you also need to consider what the common layer thicknesses that we construct materials with. And for example, for the granular base materials, they're commonly, the thicknesses we normally use are for 100 to 150 millimetres. And when you get above 150 millimetres thickness, uh, there are difficulties getting adequate compaction. So generally, uh, base coarse layers are in the range 100 to 150 millimetres. So for this particular case, you can see that the design chart requires about 150 millimetres of base coarse. So we can use that as part of our uh, total 420 millimetres cover above the subgrade. We can use the 150 millimetres we talked about earlier uh, in terms of a lot, we, we can use 150 millimetres of a lower subbase and which has a design CBR of 15 in this case, a minimum. So it's got more than adequate cover because it, it's, it's got the cover required for CBR 10 material and you could use 120 of a lower subbase. So I haven't used the 220 millimetres that we talked about earlier because that will reduce the lower, the upper subbase to a layer less than 100 millimetres thick, which would be difficult to compact. So in this case, I've provided a thicker upper subbase than I need according to the design chart and a lower subbase layer uh, because of the practicalities of commonly used layer thicknesses of 100 to 150 millimetres. So we use a combination of the design chart cover requirements, plus some constraints about uh, the, the commonly used layer thicknesses to get adequate compaction of layers. So each of, some of the road agencies in Australia have their own uh, variations on this design chart. And this is the chart, for example, that's used by VicRoads in their design um, guidelines. Uh, the total thicknesses of cover are the same. They're exactly the same uh, as the Ostros figure 8.4. But you can see that they've supplemented that by some requirements about the properties of the granule materials in terms of the minimum qualities and thicknesses of those materials. Because particularly the higher the traffic loading, uh, the more the deformation of the granule materials contributes to the total surface deformation. So that they require some very strict requirements in terms of uh, qualities of materials such that uh, particularly of heavily traffic roads to inhibit surface deformation because of the importance of that to the total surface deformation. And you can see uh, the chart on the left hand side here that there, there are requirements in, in terms of the base quality, for example, vary according to the design traffic loading and also according to the rainfall. So in drier parts of Victoria, in say north of the, the dividing range, where the rainfall is low, you could use a, a, a much lower uh, a material with a lower uh, soaked CBR result than you would uh, around Melbourne here, uh, which uh, you require a minimum of 80 uh, 
uh, for the tra this traffic loading for lightly traffic roads. And for medium to heavily traffic roads, you'd need a material with a, a CBR, a minimum of four day soak CBR of 120. So you can see that the base course requirements vary with the traffic loading, in other words, the importance of the road, and also the rainfall, because uh, the rainfall affects the uh, deformation characteristics of the granular material. And that, that, that requirement relates to the top 100, 100 millimetres of base, and then there are other requirements for the lower part of the base course. So you can see that the design chart is, is also supplemented by some empirical rules about qualities of material. So we provide an adequate thickness of cover to inhibit deformation, plus we also provide uh, certain, in, certain material qualities that reflect our specification that are, that are again largely empirically based those specifications based on things like gradings and plasticities. Uh, and uh, so a combination of this design chart plus sp empirical specifications of uh, qualities of materials that are used uh, in, in using this design chart. So in terms of surfacings, as I mentioned earlier, um, this chart is commonly uh, used with these sort of pavements uh, commonly have a sprayed seal bituminous surfacings uh, that we've talked about in previous sessions and they could be single single seal which might be a single application of binder with a single uh, application of sealing aggregate or it could be a double double seal for example there were two applications there are a whole range of possible uh, sealing configurations that could be used and these are just some of the examples so that, that's the common surfacing that's used on the granular base. But there are some situations where it might be difficult to hold uh, a sealing aggregate like that and you end up getting stripping. Uh, that might be a result of say turning movements of heavy vehicles. You might have troubles uh, in holding that surface together because the aggregate rips uh, from the bituminous layer. In those sorts of situations, you might turn to an asphalt for surfacing. And so it's possible to use this design chart with surfacing thickness up to 40 millimetres. Um, but what we do say is that if you do do that, there is, there is a risk of, of that you get fatigue cracking of the asphalt limiting your life. So it's a risk that the designers uh, need to uh, consider when they uh, adopt this sort of pavement configuration with a thin asphalt uh, surfacing. There is a risk that it will actually, you will actually get uh, fatigue cracking and the surfacing will need to be re removed and replaced uh, prematurely. You might have designed the granular pavements for, for 20 years, but you might have to remove and replace this thin asphalt wearing course five to 10 years after opening to traffic. So if you do use this chart, there's no considerations of the fatigue of the asphalt layers and there's a risk that you might get fatigue cracking. Some designers might uh, attempt to um, reduce the risk of that happening by using polymer modified binders in the asphalt, which have um, higher fatigue lives. So in summary, I, I've Describe the empirical chart that we call figure 8.4 of uh, part two. And you can see that uh, the cover requirements depend on the CBR of the material, the Californian bearing ratio, an, an index of the strength of the material and the number of load repetitions. So the common surfacing type is uh, a sprayed bituminous seal but it can be used, the chart can be used for pavement surface with thin asphalt layers. So please uh, uh, send in your questions with the slide number uh, and I'll hand it over to Haruna now to talk, uh, to, to address the questions. Thank you.
thank you very much, uh, Jeff. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, so question number one is on slide number 11. Uh, could you please briefly explain how this uh, empirical chart uh, has been developed uh, from the heavily trafficked payment to the lightly trafficked one? How's it, why is it different and? Uh, oh yeah, it's, it's how it developed. Well, they're both, um, the I'll go back to the origins of the uh, figure 8.4 first. I've, there, I've, I have written a report on the origins of this uh, chart and um, so I can provide that information if anyone's interested in looking at, in detail about the origins of it. But briefly, I've traced it back to uh, probably about the 1920s or 1930s. Uh, it was used first for aircraft loading. There was some, an empirical design chart there uh, that was developed about the wheel loads, the thickness of cover required for different aircraft wheel loads. So it was a bearing capacity type chart initially, um, which the thickness depended on the subgrade CBR and also the wheel load of the aircraft. And then that became started to be used for uh, roads and eventually we translated those wheel loads into load repetitions of heavy vehicles. And then it, then it became design traffic in ESAs of loading. So in, that, in this case, it's a chart that has sort of evolved um, from a chart that was used as a really a bearing capacity chart and then was translated from, from that bearing capacity chart to more or less a chart that looks at fatigue of, you know, it's the fatigue characteristics, number of load repetitions. In the case of the uh, lightly trafficked chart, that was developed uh, by, uh, by ARB um, probably about 30 years ago now. There was a study of the performance of lightly traffic roads um, throughout Australia. And, and from that, from that information about the pavement configurations, the subgrade CBRs, and this chart was developed. So that one, there, there is a, a report around uh, showing uh, the data that was used to develop the chart. So there was a report, particularly uh, an ARB employer called Peter Mulholland. If you, you're interested, you could uh, find out a, a report that was written by him uh, probably about 30 years ago now. So it's based on Australian performance data of lightly trafficked roads. Thank you very much, Jeff. So we'll share the uh, publication details uh, for further clarification. And the last question is on slide number 18. Uh, what is the permanent uh, deformation criteria used uh, to design this unbound payment uh, for a given traffic ESA? What, what is the permanent deformation, deformation criteria? criteria. Yes, yes. Um, that we don't specify uh, in the guide what the terminal condition is that we're designing for, but it's commonly uh, assumed to be about 10 to 20 percent of the length with rutting of about 20 millimeters or more. So that that is commonly uh, assumed to be the condition. Uh, at which the pavement would need to be rehabilitated. So it's not stated in the guide, but that's the common understanding. Thank you very much, Jeff. That's the last question, and I'll hand it over to you to wind up the session. Right, thank you. Well, thank you again for coming to this session. Uh, next week, we'll be discussing the mechanistic empirical design method, where we're looking at not only empirical data about how pavements are performed, but also a mechanistic model uh, of response to load and how we can couple those things together to look at 
uh, pavement design that considers the fatigue characteristics of bound materials and particularly which we can't do for um, uh, using the empirical design chart. So thank you again and uh, I'll, we'll see you next week.